Today's guest is Maria Horones, an absolute force of success and a joy to speak to. As well as being a Forbes 30 under 30 honoree, being signed at age 11, Maria's worked at Raby, Fender, YouTube, and was the senior partnership leader at Reddit. They now run their own company, Cool Shit, Cool People, and have worked with everyone literally everyone from the likes of Nick Cave to T-Pain, Flume, Post Malone, The Black Keys, and so much more. They're also just such a good friend of mine and helped me in so many ways when I began my YouTube journey. So I'm just really excited for you to dig in to today's episode. Please enjoy. I messaged you on Instagram to make sure we were still on. And then on my feed popped up my monthly um, like tarot I'd say recap, like the te- what is what lies ahead for the month. Sure. Dude, I do it every month. Yeah. And every month at the end of the month, I'm like, I don't even believe in it. Like, I'm not religious. I don't believe in this stuff. I don't know why I follow this guy. And every month when it pops up, it starts going like um, Scorpio, Aries and things like that. And I see those posts and I'm like, when will it be my turn? When will it? When will they talk about Libra? And then I like listen to it, and I go, ah, I'm not going to pay any attention to that anyway. But then if it's like a bad month, I'm like, oh, I can't fucking tell me. He he had that. He had those six of cups. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any of that? I have tons of those. Unfortunately, you do? I think yeah. Like I I I. It's funny. I have my fortune i'm looking at my fortune cookie thing that it gave okay. me this past my niece dude i always have to eat the cookie before i read the fortune otherwise it doesn't come true like i firmly believe I didn't know that was a thing no no no. i don't that's think it's your a thing, thing. <laughs> yeah, it's my thing <laughs> yeah like i can't i've heard of this before like other people do this but then there are like like monsters that will like read the fortune before they eat the cookie and i was like the cookie was given to you by the universe. You have to eat the cookie of life. Like okay. I'm like very much like in that sentiment or like I have like, um, like when I go out to surf, for example, I don't, I don't surf as often these days, but, mm. um, when I used to, uh, I would do like a little prayer, um, very spiritual oh. person. Um, and my sweet dad is also like, I think I come from like creatures of habit, you know, and my, my sweet dad, Every time we're in the car driving away from the house, he mm-hmm. always like asks each of us like touch each other and does like a little prayer to make sure we come back okay. And that it's is, incredibly that's sweet. So, that's so lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, did, so very did you grow up religious then or no? I I would say I'm religious. Um, I think it, I struggle with the. I know that means different things to different people, right? Mm. I think what I consider myself is I consider myself a Christian. Uh, I, but I'm also like intersectional in a lot of things. I'm queer, Mm. non-binary, Christian, Mm. Latinx. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of people think of like think people in that all, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, but I believe that I think I found the path for, uh, faith is within the, like kind of the lessons and teaching of Christianity. But I think, um, I don't necessarily believe that, um, that is the only translation of faith you know yeah, um yeah. is the kind of the way i think about it interesting well, there we go well we did look listen it's start off on a tangent <laughs> <laughs> Maria Herones, welcome to the podcast um how are you doing today i'm good you caught me on a funny day it was funny i was uh going into this conversation and i was like i was so happy to see you and like already just like feeling nice. like much bunch of relief but woke up this morning to like two pieces of uh annoying news so i was like okay "Okay." like that's 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 so funny how it just like combats each other um Mm -hmm. but yeah so i like came into this and i was like i'm really happy to talk to my friend now you know absolutely i'm really happy to talk to you today dude um why don't you kick things off for those that don't know you um can you tell us a little bit about who you are what you do and then maybe backtrack to like growing up and, and what life was like to to lead to like some of these current years yeah 100 percent. um so my name is maria gabriela gironas my pronouns are they them uh and i do a lot of things but i narrow it down to two things um uh, my bruce wayne is i'm the general manager of key change us it's a nonprofit championing gender equity inclusion in the music industry um and so causes i'm very passionate about and then my batman is 
years, I run a company called Cool Shit Cool People. It's a consulting agency for music, tech, creators, uh, and businesses all in those veins. Um, and so that's what I've been doing for uh, a little over a year and a half now. Um, and like seven, seven, eight months on the key change side. I love that. Bruce Wayne and Batman. Is that... You didn't say that for the first time today. That's something that you like, bro. I've used it before, and I did come up with it. I will take full you credit. Did. I've never, I have never heard anyone else describe anything like that before. And I was like, I think I was on a panel or something like years ago, yeah. and it just came out. And I was like, wow, that makes more sense than like anything else I've said to like describe how I do my work. You know, I'm not going to be the first person, but I am going to be <laughs> stealing it. And I will yes. be using it because it's amazing because I struggle <laughs> with like, you've known this. I struggle with the title of what I am. When I was yeah. a teacher, super easy to meet people. And, and it doesn't matter who across the board, uh, mums, dads, friends, colleagues, pe people that you want to do business with. Well, I teach in a college. This is the age range. Blah, blah, blah. Everybody gets the deal. What do you teach? music, sports, science, whatever, as long as you put teacher in front of that, it's all good. And then when I was a session drummer, oh, that's an interesting job. Depending on who you speak to, people have different questions, but generally they get session drummer. Now when people ask, I'm not even sure. So depending on who asks, I'm like, um, if they're a little bit older and it's a little bit more formal, then I say online educator. If they're younger, then I'll gravitate towards youtuber but i don't want to say youtuber and i definitely don't want to say content creator yep bruce wayne batman is sick yeah no <laughs> please take it with you i want everyone to have it but i i feel exactly the same i i think that um i think uh society has created a lot of identity based on the thing you do um, mm -hmm. like sometimes to certain people, your values determine on how interesting or relevant or how much they understand the role you have. And I think when I tell people Batman and Bruce Wayne, they kind of just get it, which is very yeah. weird. <laughs> like for some reason, like I'm explaining that I have multiple jobs and have multiple hats and I do these two things is more complicated than explaining, oh, this is my Bruce Wayne and my Batman. And like people just have never like, cons like followed up on it, you know? <laughs> it's also a great. Um, it's twofold in the sense that it puts people at ease because they get a lip. It's not out. It's not a ha ha funny thing, but it's outwardly right. showing I'm quite a relaxed person. This is how I'm going to describe it. Yeah, I'm show you a little bit of my personality. But on the as as you alluded to, it gives people an idea and jumping off points of conversation where they're like, um, oh, okay. So as you're speaking, they're like okay, so which one is her hobby? Which one is she truly passionate about? Which, like, where's the overlap here? I can see how these jobs interlink. Anyway, fantastic. I'm going to stop blowing smoke off of your ass and the rest of the podcast will be, like, I'm just going to bring you down to earth a little bit more. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I need to take my ego down a little bit, but. Yeah. Um, you have, and, and, and as we'll, we'll uh, speak more on, your career has been vast because... Even the uh, big three in, in in my mind, I know that to you and to other people, there will be um, other brands and titles that are bigger, but because I'm a music guy and music's greatly important to you, Fender, YouTube, and Reddit, in my mind, seem vastly, vastly different worlds to work in. From your perspective, working at those roles did you start to see some kind of overlap where you were like, I get this, this is just like this, or or, or did you have to put on uh, different hats, so to speak, and get in a different frame of mind? That's a really good question. I think um, they are very different. Um, I think, though, most of the work I've done in my career has always been, like, it's like kind of three buckets. It's like sales, marketing, and like lead generation education. I put that in kind of a similar category. Um, can you, t can you just describe that third one? I'm not, yeah, I don't know if I'm yeah. Le like lead generation is attributed to the work stream when in marketing, where you are trying to, um, get people to get interested or express interest into the product mm -hmm. of sorts. And a lot of the times how lead generation happens is like education. Um, yeah. 
so for example, uh, like, I, I mean, as a musician, and I'm sure some folks that are in this podcast, you know, are musicians too. They're like, you know, you see TuneCore or CD Baby. Or Distro Kids. Those other platforms, they're okay. And all jokes aside, they don't give you the support like DistroKid does. I've been a member of DistroKid for years. And even before they became a sponsor, I was a member of DistroKid. I'd use the other platforms, but DistroKid just made it easy. You can split royalties with your collaborators at the click of a button. They have all the promotional tools you would need. And they integrate everything from playlists to artwork creation and mastering tools all within your membership. And they have an app to make it even easier. If you want to join me on the platform and get 7% off your first year and help support the show at no extra cost, use the link in the description. Right. Enjoy the rest of the episode with no further interruptions. Or these companies doing these like, come to this panel for TuneCore or come to this panel for CD Baby or like, let TuneCore teach you how to do this thing. You know, that is a lead generation exercise to get people in the room to at least get interested in like what TuneCore or CD Baby or these companies are trying to talk about. And from there, it's like uh, the next flow of that is to like close the deal. But mm-hmm. like lead generation education has been a lot of like a third bucket together for me mm-hmm. in the work I've done at those three companies in particular. Wow. And then as you're, as you're, what was the, so the last of those three would have been Reddit. Did you feel as nervy to that brand name, being a recognized brand name, the same as Fender, the same as YouTube? That is a name that everybody knows. And with YouTube and Reddit is in everybody's home. Obviously, Fender, if you're if you're not a guitarist, then maybe don't know. Was yeah. that something that when you uh, set foot in that space, you were like, I've done that before, you were able to self-soothe? Or was there similar kinds of anxieties going into that space? I think I, I think after my time at YouTube, I stopped having a sense of, um, for lack of a better expression, like drinking the Kool Aid, <laughs> like uh, of okay. like the brand and such you work for. Like, mm-hmm. um, I also think what helps with Reddit um, is that I knew the platform, and I think like culturally it's in the zeitgeist, but I wasn't like an avid user of it. I wouldn't even say Mm. I was a lurker necessarily. Like I was, I kind of stumbled into it. Like sometimes I wouldn't realize I was on Reddit, which is very common for folks that use the platform and such. Um, But I think what made me really interested in the job and the team is that I was so passionate about community and what a place for that to exist. So going into it, I wasn't necessarily nervous about, um, like the job itself because I knew I could do that. I think what was really lovely was realizing how passionate people felt about the platform. Um, like where I was like, I wanted to like match that, you know, like I would meet these people who are like, man, I found, I, you know, I, I got a lot of stories of like meeting people for the first time and they're like dove in intimately, you know, they're mm-hmm. like, I, Oh, I love Reddit. I, my son, like, uh, his car was on the side of freeway and he posted on Reddit to like figure out how to fix it. And then someone explained it to him and that's how you did. And then you see all these other things of like, I had someone once uh, explain that um, they came out on the platform wow, before okay. they told any of their other family members. And I'm just like, it, it's funny. Like when people feel like they can be so honest with you and that's so lovely, but yeah. I, I remember being like, Oh man, I've never done that to this. Like, but I, <laughs> Like, I love that you have that experience and I want to find, help people have that experience too Mm -hmm. on the platform, you know? Generally speaking, I don't normally leave comments. If I don't like something, I definitely don't leave a comment or a review. I just leave. And then there are people on the internet that live vastly different, talking of, you know, Bruce Wayne and Batman. (laughs) Yeah, totally get it. (laughs) Where they're like, I'm going to fucking talk about this. And like, you know, whether it be TripAdvisor, Google reviews, or just the comment section of Reddit or YouTube, there are people that like, they live their second life on online. Actually, that might be a fun talking point from the inside. I don't know how much you can share or not share, and I'll cut out whatever you don't want to share. Um, Oh, you can ask me anything. Go for it. (laughs) YouTube, Reddit. Mm -hmm. Were there things that you found from, um, you know, being on the inside where you found darker corners of the internet that you didn't know existed or not so much? Yeah, I think I got more of that during my time at YouTube because it was earlier in my career, frankly. Really? Okay. Um, and 
Um, I think the one thing I will say is that there's this real Smith quote I really love that is, it says, um, or he, he said on like a late night show, racism isn't new, it's just being filmed. You know, <laughs> and the whole like kind of thing I say, I say that in the context of your question because it's not that bad is new in the world, right? It's just being like kind of put through a microscope on the internet. Mm. So like YouTube, Reddit, Facebook, uh, Meta, uh, like all these platforms have badness on their platform. Mm -hmm. And there's amazing people and teams that whose whole job is to fight that Mm. um, in any way possible. So, but I think as far as like my personal thing, I think it was like um, really like sobering to remember the internet is not just this like really like marvelous, beautiful, like, like pot of gold at the end of the rainbow place, you know, like for every like funny meme you see, there are much darker shit Mm. that is happening too. Um, And so I I think that I don't mean to give like a political response. I just generally yeah. feel like um, when I learned more about it, I was realizing what we're trying to do to also fight it. And it's really amazing. The people that are on the front lines, literally watching all that content, trying to stop it. And I don't know if I could have that job, frankly. It's heavy. It's heavy. Yeah. Very, very heavy stuff. If we, I'm so excited to speak to you and I already know so much about you and and your career and where we're at right now but for the sake of our audience i want to jump back um in in just in some of those first i know your career started long before uh fender and we can talk about uh those checkpoints if you like but getting into kind of your lane and and what you do for the for the audience watching at home, younger people, people looking to switch careers into something that is um, more like minded to to their hobbies, pastimes, their Batman. Um, how did you kind of get into into those? Was it just like LinkedIn applying for jobs, or did you have a particular like kind of entrepreneur mindset mindset? I think for me, um, uh, so I'm the child of immigrants and I think for me, it was just like, I got to get a job. Like it's not, I think there's a little bit in the mindset of like child of immigrants or like first generation where you're thinking about like, I'm going to start my own thing one day. I feel like I only really got to that place out of a place of need over the past few years and I can get back to that. But to start, I just really wanted a job, you know? Mm -hmm very simple. Like I wanted to work for someone I wanted to learn and I wanted to invest my life into advocating for artists and creators in whatever job that was in. Um, and how that kind of stemmed from was earlier on, I was an artist myself and a creator myself. I was like musician. I had a record deal. I played and I, you know, had some poor experience as a result of it. And I really wanted to devote my rest of my life to like making sure no one ever ever felt that way. Mm -hmm. And I think to start, like, you know, if you're kind of starting in your career, uh, it's a lot of internships. It's a lot of like get making friends and like knowing the right time to like kind of, uh, approach a relationship sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I think that, when I first started out, my first real job was like a pub being a publicist and mm-hmm. that job I got, um, through Ray Rolden, who's amazing and still at that company, Ray B Inc. And, um, uh, he like just saw how much work I was doing in the music industry, how much I was hustling, how many people I was meeting and how I was trying to just create community anytime I got a chance to, and he gave me a shot and it was such a fun way to like start the industry. Cause I think there's a lot of, I, I think back at that and I'm so glad that I started out in a job that required a lot of asking people for things because mm-hmm. you learn how to ask for people for things better, you know, yeah. and, and getting used to people saying no as well. I bet. Yes. Oh my God. Absolutely. You get used to people saying no, you get used to like understanding like what sales is like overall. Cause I think that is the essence of the work. Um, and then from there I was really lucky and I got reached out by uh, a recruiter at YouTube 
Um, and it possibly applied to a job before. And I just don't remember, to be honest, but, um, I got an email one day that they're interested in a job at YouTube. And in my wildest fucking dreams, I never thought I would ever work for a company like YouTube. Like that was not in the bingo fucking card. That was not in like, that was like, lawyer pilot works at youtube you know <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, like that is like this like the equivalent of like my family friend i remember when i called my parents and told them i like had an interview they like gasped in a way that they like gasped when uh you know i told them that i wanted uh that i was like graduating college and i was doing all these things so it's just like it's that that kind of moment of like entering in that in the music tech, uh, in more of the tech creator economy, I would even say more than music, but like, cause I was already in the music world. Um, but expanding that I can do something that isn't, um, uh, like, uh, takes my experience and still provides value from it into a different organization, let alone one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, I was just amazed and I like surprised myself. And I think I've surprised myself ever since with the, the other jobs I've gotten. Let's talk about that, the su- surprising yourself. What was the thing that you found uh, in, in the face of all the, the the challenges that you had at, whether it be YouTube or, or, or the jobs that came after, what was the thing that surprised you the most that you were like, huh, I didn't, I didn't know I could do that? On that, I didn't know I could do that. Um, I feel like it was a lot of little things, like... I wouldn't frankly consider myself and I don't, I don't mean to like ask for anything from this. So please don't, but like, I, I don't frankly consider myself um, like a, like a smart person, like a smartness defined by the way that like, I was horrible at the SATs. I've never been like a standardized testing person. I don't have like a mass amount of knowledge or like a really good, strong, logical understanding of things. I would say okay. sometimes, you like, know, I'm going to disagree. I know you, t- you I, said, I, 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 I saw it percent? and I was like, no, 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 but no, I, I genuinely mean it. Like, I think sometimes like <laughs> it takes me, I have found this challenge in my life that it takes me a long time to digest something mm-hmm. that someone can digest very easily because it's mm-hmm. just so they have like just a background or foundation that's just stronger, frankly. Yeah. And, um, like when I started being able to like, really like, like stop, like, like doubting myself and start taking that in, like, okay, it's going to take me a little longer. So that means I have to work a little harder mm-hmm. and that means I have to be more prepared. And that's kind of, I will say like a bit of a toxic mentality because it does get you burned out in some way. But what helped me in that is like, it helped me realize that just because I need to work a little harder doesn't mean I shouldn't, you mm-hmm. know? And that really got me into this vein of like working these companies and be like, Oh shit. Like I didn't come up with a strategic plan or go to market strategy yeah. or like think about, I like do all this analysis on those numbers and Excel sheet, like all the other dudes that are at these, like, you know, Patagonia wearing boat shoes, like Ivy league graduates that I'm working with, you know? Yeah. Um, and God bless them truly. But <laughs> I had these like moments where I was like, Oh, I can go toe to toe with them. Like, yeah. and now I'm fully confident in that. Like I have no doubts in my mind that I can go toe to toe with any educated individual, not to say this necessarily disregard their education by any means. That's not the point. It's more that um, I know that I can prepare enough and then I can do more to match up if I need to, but I don't necessarily feel like I have to do that as much anymore. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's fantastic. And I think it has a snowball effect as well, right? You do it once and you'll go... Okay, well, maybe there was luck was on my side, and then you do it again, and you're like, okay, well, bloody hell, uh, what well, what did I do these two times? And there's something that I've said to other people now that happens with me, and I and I don't know if you're the same, but when I have those, the last the last week um, that that I've had was by far the most stressful, I'd say of of this year, if not the last year, and. Hmm just like a lot of contracts coming in at the same time, I happen to say yes to them all thinking that one is bound to fall through. And then not only did they all go through, but they all had the exact same deadline, like to the day. And so super stressful to try and get things done uh, and then carry on like the YouTube stuff, the live streams, like everything's cool. I'm just showing up. And there's a small part of me nowadays 
that kind of gets excited by it because I recognize that when the first time it happened, I wanted to like bury my head in the sand. I can't believe, like, why, why is this even my career? I should go back to teaching better yet. I should be like stacking shelves. And yeah. then when I kind of, uh, went for whatever that activity was and, and got stuck in, normally I would meet people, other opportunities came my way. Now what's happening is I recognize that when my back is in a corner and I'm up against deadlines, I'm working so quickly and I get into such a flow state that normally I have ideas that are shooting off from that. Like, oh, when this is over, I'm probably going to get involved with that. And I should email this person. I should do that. There's just this, everything kind of goes into slow motion. I don't know if any of that's making sense, but it's like a fantastic snowball uh, effect of when you recognize like that, oh shit, I didn't know I could do that moment. All of these doors open where you're like, well, maybe I can do that. And actually I'll probably be pretty good at that if I can do this, you know, if the, if Boat Shoes over there is doing it, I can, you know. Like... <laughs> no, 100%. I, I think it, it, it really, um, it creates roots in healthy places. You know, when you find yourself confident in one thing and you start like building confidence in others. I also firmly believe that I think in order to have a healthy life, uh, or a happy one or a content one, even, um, you need to find joy that is not in your day to day, you know, like, okay. I, right. I think like I, the more I can find confidence in like other activities I do, whether or not I'm good at it, that's not the thing, you mm. know, it's like, I could be bad at something, but confident in it, but it doesn't matter because mm-hmm. it's not my job, you know, like, and that I think is a very powerful thing and i i've really adopted that more over the years and it's changed it's really changed my life and added to the happiness of it i actually had this written down as a question that i wanted to say f- till later but this is the perfect segue for it sure. um ever since i've known you which is best part of three years four years now yeah. um like <laughs> you've <laughs> you've always seemed like probably one of the busiest people I know. I know that your your calendar is always stacked. Um, do you, well, through what you've just alluded to, I assume you make time for downtime for your personal space. What does that look like and how does it affect going back to work and, and, and you kind of making moves? Yeah, I think, um, I think there was a point where I tried to structure it a lot. And structure I started, the downtime? yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I try to structure the downtime a lot. And I think there are seasons where that works really well, but there are seasons like now where that doesn't work as well for me. Mm-hmm. Um, like I think I'm in a season right now where I am like ready to pick up like new hobbies and just see if I like them, uh, versus like kind of commit to the ones I've like done for a bit now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as far as like how that relates to like, work and downtime and such like I feel like lately I've been just trying to check in my body and just trying to you know I've been very exhausted like I've been having trouble sleeping and having trouble like kind of um like having energy all day you know like have a good like good energy for like maybe like the good like till 2 p.m 3 p.m and I have this like wave of like whoa like what's going on. And given, I should also say, I start my days at like seven mm-hmm. or 6 AM. So I'm like, I'm awake for a lot of the day, but it's hard when you're like working like normal hours where you're like, need to continue on yes. with that, you know? Um, so I think I've been more gentle with myself recently to not have like hardcore hobbies, but a lot of like, I'm going to start a new show and I'm going to finish it. So I just, uh, um, I started new girl from okay. scratch, like a uh, couple uh, like a month or two ago and I'm like almost done with it. And it brings me kind of such weird joy to like know that I've always wanted a like, it's been a minute since I've started a show that I didn't know. And then now I've got to end it. And it's just like nice to feel like I've done something. And I know it doesn't sound like I'm doing anything at all. Sounds like I'm watching like too much TV, but I feel like for me that just, it brings me joy to like look at art and culture and like to kind of take that in in that way. And also like, um, I think sometimes when you watch shows or film or media or look at art or listen to art, you, it hits you differently at different moments. You know, like I could 
like I think if I watched New Girl when it came out, it probably wouldn't have hit his home as much as it is now. Right. Where I feel like it's a show about chosen family and being very tender. And I mm-hmm. like now I'm watching the show. I'm like, I love my friends, you know, yep. where five years ago I've been like, I don't have many friends or like or yeah. things like that. Yeah. Dude, that's so interesting. Every I've never said this before. Every year I uh, watch Desperate Housewives every year, right? Which wow, not many people know it. about me. I like three, yeah, three people know that know that about me. I do it every year. I watch it. It's like uh, however many seasons. It, it's it's fewer than you think, but there's still quite a lot to get through because there's so many episodes. Sure. I start it from the beginning. I watch it right the way through. It's dated. It's you recognize all the problems with it now because it's so whitewashed, right? It's yeah, like yeah. just just perfect white people that live in this like little suburban town which is also part of the joke and it kind of gets better they like they introduce um like different characters as as time goes on and it it does become a little bit more modern but the reason i watch it every year is because apart from like you say like the art and stuff because there's very few shows where they like built a town and like that is a, a physical location all the houses you can go in like so from the cinematic point of view that i'm into or cinematographer po- part of it that i'm into that's interesting the other thing is i'm an anxious person through and through which loads everybody knows totally. that about solidarity me. yeah and so like i need a show sometimes where um there's a little bit of humor but it's not yeah. like ha ha um friends big bang like cheesy humor there's a little totally. bit of like humor there's a little bit of like deception. I'm a sucker for a love story. So I like this, like, will they, won't they, the notebook kind of shit. But then also I, I know exactly how it's going to end. The opposite can be said for the show Chernobyl, which I tried to watch when it came out. And I got two episodes in and I was like, well, dude, what are you doing? You know exactly <laughs> how this ends. There's not going to be a, ha- they're not just going to rewrite the ending and be like, yeah, and they put the plot back that together. It weird they gave you hope at the beginning. I was like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> dude, there's just one scene where, um, I think it's the, se- I think either the first episode or the second episode, I definitely dipped after two. Yeah. where like all the families are up on a bridge and they're watching oh. like the nuclear fallout as if it's fireworks because they they don't know what's going on they're watching it and like people's skin starts peeling a little bit and i was like dude it's too dark for me i am out <laughs> um yes yes but it's so funny that you to, to to go back to your point it's so funny that you speak on that because i used to do a similar thing where i would almost look forward to when i was ill so if i was to get sick I knew that that was time I had to spend in bed and I would have permission to watch movies, what watch shows, whatever. Whereas yeah. if I wasn't ill, I had to be doing something. So I'm very much in the season that you're in where I want to try new things. Cause I, I think at the end of the last year or, or beginning of this year, I was very vocal about, um, I had, a, I had the first like Christmas period on my own, which wasn't sad. It was like, really wonderful i was like i'm going to decorate i'm going to do all these things on christmas day but what i found because i was journaling was um i really if you were to ask me who i am not like youtuber teacher drummer whatever but like who i am i don't know who i am uh, or didn't know who i was Uh, i knew my core values but i didn't really know what like truly made me smile i didn't really know what my hobbies were it was like I like music. I do music things. I like, you know, talk to music people. But I'm not somebody that wakes up and like wants to make music. I, it's like mm-hmm. a, it is a job. And I try to work in the confines of like nine to five um, so I can leave it there. But after that job is over, I like make food, sometimes go to the gym. Like I, I live a very lived a very rigid life. And and similar to you or or to what I think you were saying is prior to the Christmas period, I also didn't really know who my friends were. So I went around telling everybody, even if we were friends, I would tell people like, I only really have two friends. And I would say like you and then the person that you know, that we know in our like thing. And I would say that to everybody. And it was this really weird hypocritical moment where I was like, I definitely do like stuff. And I definitely have more than two friends. And I started like yeah. sitting into that and I'm doing exactly what you're doing right now where I'm trying things. I've got like a membership pass to the um, 
to the like i don't know what you would call it like the leisure center and i've been just trying loads of different sports i'm not a sporty guy as you know i i'm i don't follow any teams i don't like any particular sports golf seems to be the thing i'm like gravitating towards but i'm like okay. really bad at it i genuinely have videos on my phone that i can send you where <laughs> i i like <laughs> i i like it's i've been there for like a couple of weeks i'm trying to go early in the morning i'm trying not to disturb people and I like set, I don't even know the words. I'm trying to think of it as I'm speaking to you, but I like set up or whatever at, at the golf range. I hit the ball. It hits the ceiling because I'm not on the course. I'm just like in that little <laughs> yeah, yeah. underground bit. <laughs> it hits the ceiling. It hits the guy next to me and it rolls back and also hits the camera. And oh I like have to apologize to this. It's me and the, I mean, more for him as well, because there was so many different bays that he could have gone into. And I feel <laughs> yeah, like it's yeah. be kind of like a, guys at the urinal kind of rule like i'll go all the way yeah left, yeah one space go all the way <laughs> right that's it yeah but he came and like butted up next to me and there was 12 different spaces but you know i tried to be like oh i'm so sorry like i'll, I'll give you some of my <laughs> i'll give you some of my balls and like he was like dude you're good and he just like that was him done for the day um that being said like i keep go i've got the bug i keep going back and i've like tried um i'm going basketball soon i've tried like squash badminton i'm just doing different bits and the more i do the more i speak to to people outside of a context that i can talk to them yeah because a girlfriend pointed out to me once this is like back when i was in college she said um anytime that she said, you do something that's really interesting. I said, what's that? And she said, anytime that you speak to someone and they bring up a topic of conversation that you're not familiar with, you're able to draw it back to music. And I was like, how so? And she was like, someone would bring up, foot I'm like, uh, like venomously against uh, foot soccer, football. And, sure. uh, you know, a girlfriend's dad normally or, or generally a lot of guys in the UK are into football and totally. I would be able to speak on a musician who was in to a certain football team. I'd be like, oh, I watched an interview with so-and-so who spoke on this team and that team was his favorite. And apparently they had like a good season and then they would reciprocate because they would know about it, but they would be able to talk on the artist and then i would just be able to navigate into talking about music or at them about music yeah yeah and it gets me in a space where i'm able to speak to people who like i'm in their area like mm. they know this sport they're passionate about it they can give me tips and i'm on the back foot and i notice i go into the rest of my day the rest of my week feeling so much more at ease of just learning something that not only do i not know about I don't particularly care about like you said i don't have to be good at it i'm just like trying stuff and it might stick i might be bored with it next week and it's like i think it's something that has given my life so much value and i didn't recognize that setting a rigid schedule like i did probably the year or two prior to when we met i had this rigid schedule of only reading music books only watching music documentaries only doing music everything yep. had to be surrounded by music otherwise it wasn't um it wasn't uh, allowing me to get closer to that goal that i had and when i took my foot off the gas to allow like life to happen so many more opportunities came my way and just the fruits of life were more enjoyable if that makes sense yeah oh my gosh there's so much to that i um, it's really lovely to hear. I think it's, um, it's a testament to like how, um, you know, you try to meet people where they are, you know, and the mm -hmm. only way you understand, like the only road to get there for you sometimes is like relating it back to music, but you're just like, you know, it's like, you're not, but what I'm hearing is like, you're not making about it yourself. You're just trying to like define this way to get in. So you and them both feel like you're on the same ground. And I think that's really lovely. So sweet. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about um you joining the team at Reddit. Mm -hmm. What did that look like at the beginning? Um, so it was really sweet. So I had um um well not sweet start, but uh I was laid off from my previous job and in that like kind of that email you send that's like the goodbye email, like hey everyone, today's my last day. 
uh, I had met Barry Siegel, who I think you might have met through maybe possibly, through possibly. Yeah. Um, and uh, we had connected almost like a year before for my job at the time. And she was working at Dub Smash at the time. And um, she had replied to this email um, being like, congratulations, like question mark. And I was like, actually, I just got laid off. If you know anyone hiring, you know, appreciate it. And she's like, let's hop on the phone this week. And I was like, we only met once a year ago. That's such a lovely, like, that's such a lovely thing. And so we hopped on the phone. And if I remember the timing of it correctly, it was something like we hopped on the phone. She was telling me that this role was opening up and, um, but it hadn't opened up yet. And then, uh, I think she referred me to the person that was hiring for it and I ended up becoming my manager. And so first it, the, the opening of that was just like, you know, opening Reddit was just this like person who had no reason to like, you know, put my name forward other than meeting me literally twice. But I think sometimes in like business and especially if you do this work in like artist relations or talent relations, which she does, you just kind of get an initial vibe of someone and you're like, okay, like you're good. And I, I think that's really like a, that's something I really appreciate about my work. Like not necessarily try to judge a book by its cover, but there's something about being able to immediately know if you can work with someone. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really great like skill to have that mm -hmm. sometimes is a learned one. And uh, then I got entered the, I entered Reddit and it was just this like really amazing time at the company because we are we're getting ready to file for um, IPO and um, there's a lot, there's so many people being hired all the time at the time and it's getting really big, really fast. And you could tell that there had been such a culture there for like 17 years prior to me getting there. So it was just really cool to be welcomed in such a way to then be further welcomed again by such a really wonderful company culture. And I really love all the people that work there. It's a really, really great group of people. So when did, when and how did you find out that you were, you would be exiting Reddit? What did that look like? Cause it felt really, it, it seemed like it came out of the blue and, and we know other friends of ours that have since left or, or, or prior to you, uh, making an exit had also been laid off. Um, so I'm at the time, uh, had been, or was still streaming on Reddit um, and that seemed really exciting with like RPAN. There was lots of op opportunities. You gave me so many opportunities. I met so many people I knew, or the last thing I knew was how many jobs were opening and how, how much of a force they were putting on search and discovery, vertical video streaming, that kind of thing. And suddenly it was yeah. like, that all came to an end. So yeah. what did that like kind of exit scene look like for you? Yeah, it was very sudden. So, uh, I believe, so we used to have this, like, um, I want to say it was like a bi-weekly or weekly meeting with um, the head of our department. And we usually had it on a Tuesday. And I remember he asked to move in on a Thursday. And I didn't pay any mind to that. Um, and then on the Thursday, maybe 10 minutes before we were all supposed to do this meeting, we all get a notification that all of that big meeting was canceled. And then each one of us have individual meetings. Okay. So, um, and then mine was the first. And then I knew, I just like immediately, I had this feeling immediately knew that I was going to get laid off because really? I, I think, yeah, it was unfortunate, but it was, it's just kind of the way those things go. Like the person that is getting laid off is the first person they talk to because okay. then, you know, everyone else that remains is like, needs to be notified. They, that person just got laid off, you know? Okay. Um, so I had that unfortunate feeling going into it and then sure enough, he's in the meeting and then suddenly HR pops into the meeting and then tells you that you've been laid off. And it was really sad. It was, yeah. it was sad in the way that like one, we had a, had a bunch of layoffs in November of the last year. So I thought I, I didn't really think I was like, um, like, uh, what do you call it? Like, um, in, in like, I didn't think I was going to be laid off, you know, necessarily. Like I didn't, I didn't have any inkling or feeling. I had literally just gotten a promotion. I had gotten a raise. Mm -hmm. uh, I gotten like a really good rating on my review from that 
last quarter within that time period. So there was no reason for me to think anything. And then I thought in November, I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess that means I won't get laid off because all, so many other people just did. And then, and then, yeah, it was just like, it was a surprise in the way I was like, oh, damn, like, thought I was like out of this. But, um, and I, I think what made me the most sad was um, my laptop got shut down immediately. Like I never right. got to like say goodbye to anyone or like keep emails and oh, such. Oh wow, you you have no work email, so you don't have that collection. Oh wow, that exactly, is exactly yeah. So it was like a couple months of me trying to go back to like old colleagues at Reddit and just be like, hey, can you just give me this email, this person that we were on the thread with, or like, can you help me like with some of these like case studies that I did? Like I'm just like trying to make a portfolio, mm -hmm. and like I'm like didn't have any way to like contact people. That was kind. Of, that was probably the most brutal of it. Um, and but you know, it, it's the people that let me go. Like I had, I don't know what was the bottom line of it, but I don't take anything personally because I think all the recent layoffs have proved how senseless this all is. You know, there's some really great people in the job market um, for a variety of reasons, and sometimes none of which is because they were a poor performer. Mm. It's so that one part that you you spoke of there gives me so much anxiety of the the work computer being shut off without your email list because my brain goes all of those people think that I don't care about them absolutely and I'm going 100%. over time to be like no 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 I wanted to say goodbye no oh, I literally no. oh my god that it was I thought it's so funny it happened like seconds after the Zoom like closed out. And I thought my laptop had died. I just had this like thought of like, oh, I'm not um, like my, you know, I, I must have like let it die. And then I was like trying to like plug it in and I just waited and then a lot of stuff. And I was like, oh, they shut it down. Like I was like, they can do that because technology. And, and it was like almost a year. Like I think even I've had messages as recent as like four or five months ago of people being like, hey, uh, I, can you, like help me out with this reddit thing or something yeah and it's just like hey like i literally had saved a note on my phone just to have like the response and what the emails they should reach out to and such um because oh it was just so many people that had reached out and it was yeah. i was also like the second part of it like it was like not only the loose context but like to have them individually it's like it's like almost can't imagine I've ever been in a scenario, but it's like breaking up with a lot of people, but doing it one over and over and over again, mm. like type of thing, you know? Oh, that's crushing. So you exit Reddit. How quickly, because in, in, in the times that you and I speak, and especially in the online space, it seems like it was back to back. How quickly do you become a, 30, a Forbes 30 under 30 honoree? Um, I think... If I remember correctly, I think I got the, uh, I found out December 1st that I got the Forbes of 20, well, last 2023, December 1st, 2022 for the 2023 list. And then I got laid off a month after that. No so, way. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like a weird, it was a weird time. It was like, oh yeah. So were you there just kind of like, I'm a double agent. Did you have to speak on Reddit or were you there? as you well okay so oh you're talking about the conference are you talking about the like the actual list i'm so, i'm speaking on the whole experience as, as yourself because sure. pete because people are going to ask questions they're going to congratulate you and yeah so that was at working at reddit when i got the list nomination and then i was let go a month later and then i went to this forbes conference i think in uh in march uh so like two months later after i got laid off um, and then, then I was just telling people that I was like, have my own consulting agency and such. Yeah. Um, uh, so that was kind of the timeline, but it was kind of a weird thing. It was like a lot of good stuff was happening December of 2022. And then it's January, 2023. It was like, nope. Um, and it was like a whole mess of things all together. Yeah. And that consulting agency is cool shit. Cool people. Is that right? Sure. Can you tell people about that a little bit? Yeah. Cool shit. Cool people is, a. Uh, um consulting agency for the music tech creator world uh i help companies labels management brands uh organizations advise them on three things so it's usually business development uh business development strategic partnerships 
uh, marketing, everything for product artists. And then lastly, diversity and inclusion, kind of helping them understand like, like how to build a proper DEI suite through their organization or through like their product offering or something like that. And through through that and through your time in the entertainment space, you've worked with like a crazy amount of names from like Isaiah Rashad to UK's personal favorite, Kano, Julia Michaels, Nick Cave, Logic F- Flume, Post Malone, like the list goes on and goes on and goes on, especially as like as a, a, a music fans. This is terrific. A lot of that results around marketing. Is that right? Like um, showing them how to market themselves and how to market as a brand. Yeah, I think so. Some of those clients are a little different than the others, but like, um, but so some of the artists I worked with during, um, kind of to start cool shickle people were like, uh, angel 22, which is like a Latin girl group. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I was working at human resources, Q and a, I was working with artists like Brent Elliott, Moses Sumney amongst others. Um, but yeah, I, I, a lot of them I work with to, I work with artists in particular to be able to help like find their voice and help them like think about um, how they're like analytically increasing. So that's the thing too. It's like, there are a lot of people that you can hire that will be like, I will help make you big. And they don't really know how to quantify that. Mm. Like for me, it's like, okay, like I see that you're getting like, you know, a 14% increase in Spotify every month. Let's, I want to, I think if you hire me, I can help you increase that to like 16 or 17 a month. Right. Is there a particular thing that that shines to you in terms of someone that you or or a band that you want to work with? Is it just on um, people that you dig, people that you've heard f- through the grapevine, or is it like that analytical? You can see that uptick. So th- this person is a is a sure bet. I have a hard and fast rule about if I like the music or not, and mm. it's like not the definition of I think it's good or not. I think it. I just have to like it. Like. Um, and, um, and then from there I can like kind of think about everything else. Um, and everything else includes like, if I see there are things that I can actually help with, like there are artists, for example, that they have pretty strong Spotify streams and stuff like that. And they're looking to like get more shows. And it's like, that's not really what I do. I'm, I can, I know how to book a show. I know showcases. I know things that would help. But I know other people that are better for that. Like, I'd rather help you create marketing or like help with brand partnerships or strategic partnerships or business development. Like, I think those are things that I can actually contribute. Um, And like, you know, I have a lot of artists too that are like, get reach out and they're like, I really need someone to help manage my socials. I'm like, I I know people that do that. I don't want to ever like manage a social media account ever again, but I want to help you think about like what it looks like if you can do it Mm -hmm. um, and help you like, like kind of tackle that in a way. Cause I think it's just overwhelming. And sometimes people just need a plan and figuring out how to like strategically ex- execute something. In a hard and fast look, what do you think that through all of the people that you've seen, what is the the biggest commonality where people fall short in their, in their kind of branding as an artist? Um, I think that people fall short I think, I don't know if there's a through line necessarily, but I think the fo- the artists that do the absolute best are ones that have clear vision. Mm-hmm. Um, like, and I, and I don't say that in the vein of like, they always know who they are. They're people. They're not always going to know exactly who they are, but I think for an artist that has a vision in that moment, like it's very clear to tell. Mm-hmm. Like, I think earlier in my work working with musicians, I get really annoyed of artists, like to the point where like, you know, it'd be like something like, Hey, I think this could really help you if you do this, like Mm -hmm. social media partnership or something. And they're like, I don't want to do it. And I'd be like, like for me, like, and coming from me, it's like, I see, like, I have approached life, like getting every opportunity. Right. And I'm just like, like, biting my teeth at it, trying and doing my best with it. And sometimes I would interpret when artists are saying, be like, I am ungrateful and I do not want to do it because I am too good for this. Mm. But it's not the truth. I think most folks that are really great, like artists that are fantastic, 
know exactly who they are, know exactly what they want. And they don't want to do something, they can do it. And so I really like, I think sometimes I've worked with artists that they like respond to me. No. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let's, what about, what would you think about this? They're like, wait, wait, wait. You don't want to like keep bothering me about this one thing that you keep recommending. And it's like, no, cause that's not my job. Like I, yeah. Like, if you want to ask me questions about it, sure. But I'm not here to, like, make you or beg yeah. you. You're or an adult. I'm an adult. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And sometimes I feel like artists, like, they're like, some folks do need to be approached that way. And I have no business working with folks like that. I have mm. no interest working with folks that are, like, need me to. I understand that there's a learning curve and an education curve. Like, we talk about lead generation education again. but, but. I don't understand when it's just out of a place of like ignorance or like, um, like, like passive aggressive, mm -hmm. you know, cause mm -hmm. I think that happens sometimes too. So I think artists that are outstanding in their work are folks that have clear vision, um, can dictate what they want and can take information and make a decision, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's also like really important. And also I think the folks I particularly like working with and only the folks I work with these days are folks that, consider their work a business. Mm -hmm. Um, like I think there, I, the creatives are great and such like that, but you either trust someone with the business mindset to help steer in that way, or you are a creative business minded person and you yeah. are need partners to help you like kind of, um, explore that a little more. Absolutely. There's so many producers and beat makers that I sit down with on a daily basis and every now and then uh, I'll get an individual that sits down with me. And my biggest pet peeve is when someone says, well, if the music's good enough, uh, people will find it. Right. And you're like, Ooh. no, old man, that, that is not the day and age that we live in anymore. Like, and it is always an old man. Um, so, you know, <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not ostracizing the audience. It's always yeah, yeah. an old man. Um, he probably has boat shoes. Like the, <laughs> the, the, I, 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 kind of feel a little bit lost at that point because I'm like then why have you signed up for this mentorship where I'm like you say trying to help you and you're like I don't want to make uh an Instagram or a TikTok or like you know have in keeping profile pictures or anything like that and it's like then my hands are kind of tied because we'll just be making songs like in your garage as you're doing right now you know um one of the things uh that I did through my digging is that you said uh, one of the best books on marketing, I want to see if you still stand by this, is Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead. I've got an episode on five books every musician or every producer should read. And I have never come across that book, nor have I ever read it. So what would be your elevator pitch to me as to why I should read Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead? I think my elevator pitch for that book, and I think I would think any book that um, is an autobiography of an artist, I would even argue too, the best artist, and I mean best in the vein of like the biggest, the iconic, the timeless, were always in the marketing meeting. Like, mm. and the Grateful Dead were a shiny example of that. Like these mm. dudes are like, you know, I think the community and the band is known for being like these like, like hippie stoners, but they're so smart and they were always thinking about how they could you know get more at it and i think a really strong foundational lesson from their legacy and that i see of many other artists of their caliber and their uh um kind of like their distinction is that um it was always because they were in the meeting like it was always because they were listening thinking saying yes no or like going with it and trying things and uh the artists that are like that my person will go do that is never the one that's going to be the iconic one so mm. that's my pitch for that book i think it's a shiny example of a uh, um artists that were in the marketing meeting that really fucking did it you know they blew my mind recently because i found out they were like doing a residency at the sphere and yes. i was like I never saw this coming. And if there's anything more like because we all know the following that the Grateful Dead has, it was like if anything was more the Grateful Dead, it's doing a residency at the sphere and just tripping balls in this place, you know? Um 100 Maria Horones, thank you so much for being here with me. You've had tons of highlights. We've sprinkled in some lowlights as well. 
you always come out on top. I'm so grateful to be your friend. Um, what does life like look like? You know what? I mess up this sentence every time, every time at the end of the podcast when it's gone so well, I just mess up the last sentence and then I have to shoot it after. Anyway, um, what does life like look? I can't do it. What does life like look like? Like, um, I'm going to leave it in. Yeah. What does life like look like for you today? <laughs> um, life right now is um, I'm about to turn 30 uh, on the 15th. So that's crazy. Right. Um and uh that's just like really lovely like i didn't really uh no fears no reservations about turning 30 excited about it only excited yeah i think for me it's just um i think like so much is good like i i'm very in love and i have wonderful friends and family and i am uncomfortable in where i'm at in my job world not in like Mm -hmm. a bad way like i think uncomfort doesn't discomfort doesn't have to mean negative it's just like you know, I'm looking for clients and I'm getting clients and then also thinking about what a full-time job looks like again, but I'm good though. You know, like I'm happy and I'm doing, I'm feel very like centered. So just trying to like focus on that right now. Awesome. Our conversations always center me. So thank you so much for like spending this best part of an hour with me. It's like kind of late in the UK. So you've really just like read me a bedtime story because I'm going to turn the lights (laughs) off and just I know. I was thinking about like, bed. oh, why did he put this on his calendar? But no, I appreciate no. the consideration of time. So thank you. No, thank you. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, hopefully we'll invite you back for a second episode as well. I would love that. Thank you so much, my friend. <laughs> <laughs>